Okay, are you hearing me now? Because I'm not hearing anybody else talk. It's not coming back through my through my earphones. But Eric says he's hearing me, but I'm not hearing anything through earphones. <sighs> Let me try this again. Let me try this. Can you hear me now?
How about now? Can you hear me now? I can hear you and Mark the last couple of times. Did you hear me? Did you hear me the whole thing talking about the PCEP? No. Oh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, there is a problem here in River City. Uh, here I've been going along thinking this was going very well. OK, I will cut to the chase. Um, sorry about that. I can say we're having we're having technical difficulties this morning. The um, uh, the EMS officers have received uh, from Mark a, a clarification of what's required for um, for uh, meeting the requirements of the PCEP slash OTEP uh, recertification. Uh, essentially, uh, as you recall, back uh, back in the day when we were doing live presentations, we would have eight um, uh, different uh, live sessions uh, uh, going for about two and a half to three hours uh, involving lecture and as well as a uh, case review. This was all this was a package which was designed to uh, complete your uh, your continuing education requirements for recertification. Uh, as we went into the virtual sessions, we uh, realized that sitting for three hours in front of a computer uh, is uh, pretty crazy making and not very efficient as far as learning goes. And so we split the month into uh, about an hour, hour and a half lecture, followed by uh, at the end of the month, Dr. Gadbois gives uh, an in-depth case reviews, which includes science and uh, uh, Clark County protocols and a, a very deep dive into five, four or five cases every month. Uh, this whole package, which adds up to about two and a half to three hours, is what's required for you to complete to to meet that month's PCEP requirement. Uh, if you can't attend in the uh, at the quote live virtual session, uh, these are all recorded. Mark is recording this as we speak, and um, uh, you can do this at your leisure. Uh, and and the. the the only requirement is that uh, as a rule, you uh, need to review these uh, no more than a month after it's been posted in the uh, uh, in in our uh, library. So um, obviously, if people have not been following that rule, uh, we'll give you time to catch up for it for this year, but uh, if you complete the PCEP, as you know, PCEP as well as the skill sessions, which happen on the alternate months, um, that 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 will uh, qualify you for not having to take the National Registry to recertify, recertify and to have all your CE uh, credits being given. So just a just a uh, a word to the wise to catch up on those now. Um, <clears throat> all right, so today with some uh, some issues with uh, uh, teams, uh, at least on my end of it, uh, being able to hook up, Mark will be running this, so this may be a wee bit clunkier than it might be, but let's hope not. <clears throat> so today we are doing not August PSAP, but uh, March 2001 talking about EKGs, how to read an EKG. Obviously, uh, I'm not going to dive in deep depth into the whole uh, vector qualities of EKGs. I'm assuming you know uh, something about that already. So how do you read a 12 lead? I want you to notice that the first thing is that at the top is rate and rhythm. Uh, this is probably the one thing that most uh, that most physicians and most uh, paramedics have a little difficulty with is forcing themselves to look at the rate and rhythm and not be not be uh, seduced into looking at that wide complex tachycardia that is you know you sure is going to be VTAC or some other terrible thing but look at the rate and rhythm first then 
access is an important thing. It's not as important for paramedics. Uh, it's probably not as that important for uh, for uh, for emergency physicians. Even access and, and understanding access will probably gain you at least uh, an advantage in 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 sorting out whether something is a uh, a ventricular abnormality or not but it's it, it it's not as important and we're going to brush over a bit qrs duration we're going to talk about that a great deal qrs morphology and then we're going to go into STEMI and STEMI mimickers. Now, rate and rhythm. Force yourself to look at it for it. Don't get sucked into it unless the patient, of course, is not breathing and pulseless. Rate and rhythm. Note the pace. Is this fast, slow, or normal for the for the presentation of the case? If so. Look at the look at the rhythm. If you have a trauma patient who's obviously bled out and it's a fast rhythm, well, it's probably sinus tachycardia based on based on volume. Is it a regular or an irregular rhythm? Remember the big fooler in our business, the big uh, uh, the big fooler is atrial fibrillation, and then atrial fibrillation with RVR, and then atrial fibrillation with RVR tachycardia and wide complex is this supraventricular versus ventricular uh, as far as i'm concerned i'm happy with you con considering that a wide complex is a ventricular rhythm until proven otherwise with the caveat that a ventricular rhythm is going to be a regular rhythm so look at your look at your rhythm and see is it regular or irregular if it's a looks like a ventricular rhythm and it's irregular it's going to be atrial fibrillation 99 times out of 100. axis now what do you care about axis well an axis might suggest a couple of things uh if you're having someone with a chest pain um uh, you think they're having an MI and you look and they don't really have uh, ST segment elevation yet, but they have a left axis deviation that might suggest and then a, a slightly wide complex, not super wide. Uh, it might suggest that this is a left anterior, anterior fascicular block. In other words, a block in part of the uh, part of your left bundle. This also might suggest an inferior MI if you're having difficulty sorting that out, or can also be a paced rhythm. Is it a right axis deviation, which suggests a left posterior fascicular block? So another another block in, in just por a portion of the of the uh, uh, bundle. Uh, is this a lateral MI or a right ventricular hypertrophy or right acute right sided strain? So right axis go. Now, is it extreme axis, which is which is also known as uh, extreme right deviation, which might suggest VTAC, electrolyte problems, or misplaced limb leads? Now, next slide. Okay, now here's the simple here's the simple diagram. It's not it's not 100% kosher according to the cardiologist, but this is this is what will get you through the night if you really are thinking about axes. Now, norm in in a normal axis, which is the way most hearts are going to be, look at lead one only look at lead one and lead AVF for any of your axis thing uh, like i say this will get you 98 percent of the axes lead one is upright normally and lead avf is upright normally that's normal now in a left axis deviation you've got 
forces going away from AVF. So looking at AVF, AVF is going to be down left axis and lead one, it's upright as normal. Right axis deviation, simple, it's just the reverse. Lead one is down, lead AVF is up. And then the extreme right axis deviation, both leads are down. So it's the exact opposite of normal. So you're just looking at mirror images from different uh, of, of the thing. Now, let me say, am I going to use this a lot? No, you're not. But it's fun when you get used to it to see, hey, does this fit what I just said? Now, QRS intervals, are they normal or are they prolonged? So what's a normal QRS? A normal QRS is going to be under 0 0.12. Note the QT interval. QT is from the start of the Q to the end of the T. And then the QTC is a calculated number. Uh, nowadays, the QT, QTC, most modern 12 EKGs machines calculate your QT, QTC. Uh, because the Q, the Q, the QTC is adjusted based on rate. So the because the faster the faster the heart rate, the shorter the QT is 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 supposed to be. So then it has to be adjusted to see what the real QTC is. Now, uh, in 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 men, and, and there's some some argument among cardiologists. There's a variation here, but in men, the QTC should be less than 440 to 450 and women the QTC should be less than 460 it's a little bit longer what's the importance of the QT well prolonged QT so something more than 450 or 460 uh, would be suggestive of uh, uh, prolonged QT syndrome or QT being prolonged based on uh, based on medications such as amiodarone, pronestol, um, um, things like uh, uh, amitriptyline or the, the tricyclic, uh, things like uh, hypokalemia, hypomagnesiemia. Uh, and, and when you get a prolonged QT, as you know, you are at risk for not only PVCs, uh, but for um, ventricular tachycardia uh, uh, of the torsades variety. Now, morphology. If the QRS is wide greater than 0 0.12 or 120 milliseconds, look, look at V1. V1 is all you have to look at to determine in 99% of the cases, whether you have a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block. So by definition, a Y complex probably is a ventricular in origin and in most ventricular origin things either begin de novo out of that or they begin because one ventricle is depolarized before the other one. So that causes the whole QRS complex to be wider why is one complex why is one depolarized first well there's a block in the bundles simple so the left bundle if you block the left bundle the right the right ventricle is is depo begins depolarizing before the left one does and so you end up with a wide complex now if this is a right bundle branch block so that the left one is uh the the left ventricle gets depolarize first, then you have a terminal R wave. The terminal terminal means the last wave of the QRS. And the R is, of course, a positive upward deflection. Left bundle, you have a small R wave 
and a deep negative deflection in V1 because all those forces are ultimately going toward the left ventricle, which has which is the big the big muscle. It's the big dog in the room. It's the big muscle. So it's a QS wave, which is which is the dominant. It's a dominant negative wave in V1. Now, for by so now here we have various right bundle branch morphologies in lead V1, but you can see the terminal wave in in this first one, the terminal wave. And so you get the little rabbit ear kind of thing, or if if you want to call it that, that one's the rabbit ear. But the the RSR prime, you see huge R waves. But it's the terminal. It's the last part of that complex. In every one of these, you see a large R wave uh, afterwards. So this is a right bundle branch morphology. Why is that important? Well, we'll see when we get to STEMIs because you can still read, you can still read uh, STEMIs in a right bundle branch block. Left bundle branch characteristic. There you have the big R. You have a tiny R S. And then the reverse on the far side of the of the anti, of your uh, 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 chest lead V6. Now you see something that's almost like that 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 right bundle branch pattern in V1. You see you'll often see a little rabbit ear kind of complex in RSR prime um, in V6. Sometimes in V5 as well. But in V1, this other one, left bundle branch black, big, deep, deep QS wave. Or RS wave, R super big wave. Now, then as we're looking at, then we have to talk about STEMI mimickers. We'll do that. And But let's talk first about STEMI. STEMI, which is one millimeter of elevation in two or more contiguous leads. Now, there's some argument in some, among some cardiologists, they don't like one millimeter of elevation in the, in the anterior leads. But um, the convention around here and and all of our, uh, I think pretty much on the West Coast, we go with one millimeter elevation in two or more contiguous leads. So you have to know where the leads are. But <coughs> here's the here's the point I want to make. When, when you when you're considering STEMI, also think whether these people have symptoms of acute coronary syndrome, ACS. I mean, are they? Are they presenting because are, are, are is the reason you're out there because they're having a potential of a STEMI or a cardiac event, or are you out there because they're doing something else? Uh, a little old person with sepsis, for example, then you just happen to do a, a 12 lead and it doesn't look right to you. But is this a, is this ACS because? It's, it's quite a big deal if we call a STEMI. Now, we're, we're going to talk to that much more. Also, generally speaking, you can feel really good about yourself and really good about your diagnosis if you have a millimeter elevation in two or more contiguous leads and you have reciprocal changes or ST segment depression in the opposite thing. So if you have uh, ST elevation in leads two, three, or AVF, which is a, an inferior MI, and you look across on the lateral leads or on the anterior leads, and you have several millimeters of depression, ST depression in those leads, that's, you know, you're, you're pretty well, pretty well darn, darn well convinced that that's going to be a STEMI. All right, so to talk about STEMIs, you have to talk a little bit about myocardial infarction. Um, and the usual EKG evolution, and, and this is, and we, we, don't, we don't like to see this anymore because we like to catch it beforehand, but the, uh, in A, you have your normal EKG prior to the MI. Now they're having a MI, which is 
usually a complete occlusion of at least the segment of the uh, coronary arteries. Uh, and the first thing that happens in the first many minutes, besides chest pain, uh, are hyperacute T waves. Now, these are different than the peaked T waves in hy hyperkalemia. You know, they're, they're, they're hyperacute, they're bigger, they're they're higher and they're but they're rounded which is the peak peak t waves are much more peaky now there, there's some wiggle room in their interpretation there but you have hyperacute t waves increased t wave amplitude and width and you may also see a little bit of st elevation with that well that would indicate the very early STEMI. that's when we'd want to catch it then Number C shows what happens as you continue to have this injury to the this damage being occurring to the myocardium. You get marked ST segment elevation again with hyperacute T wave changes, and if anything, much wider. And that's that indicates a, an ST segment elevation like that indicates a full thickness or a transmural injury to the. Uh, to the myocardium. And as we progress over time, you now begin to develop Q waves. When does that develop? Mm, probably beginning about 24 hours after the onset of the injury. So there'll be less ST segment elevation, but now you begin to get the Q wave. And pathologic Q waves means it's deeper and wider. They, you know, in a normal QRS, of course, you've got a Q, but it's narrow and not very deep. So pathologic Q waves are at least 0 0.04 seconds. A note caller. To turn this off. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they're about 25% of the R wave. Pathologic Q waves, in, you know, as you progress now, as, as the patient survives the, myocard the infarction and, he begin and it begins to heal, you now have pathologic Q waves with T wave inversion. So now instead of elevation, you now have some inversion, which means that there's fibrosis going on because there was actual dead tissue necrosis. And then at the end of this, you have uh, after it's healed, so a week or so after the infarct, uh, and then from that point on forever, uh, you have path a pathologic Q wave in those leads, but you now have an upright T wave and, a, and the ST and T waves look pretty much normal. So where we are trying to intervene is at the level when you have ST segment elevation, because if we can get that vessel open quick enough, uh, then they don't go on to getting uh, necrosis. They don't get on, go on to getting uh, pathologic Q waves. Now, the pathologic Q waves, you know, the, your machine d can't often tell whether you've got an acute stem or not. So it'll, the, it, the, the, the 12 lead recognition will tell you said, uh, that you've got, it'll say um, uh, uh, to the effect that uh, uh, Q waves or uh, uh, possible inferior MI, uh, unknown, uh, unknown, uh, unknown time. So that's, that means it's just reading what it, what it perceives as a Q wave. Now, inferior STEMIs occur in leads two, three, and AVF. Can be all three, usually is, but it could be only any any two of those three. Uh, the reciprocals for inferior are lead one and lead AVL. A high lateral uh, 
MI is in 1 and AVL with reciprocals in 2, 3, and AVF. So it's just the reverse. Anterior is V1, V2, V3, V4, and there's no pure reciprocals. Posterior, there's nothing, you don't see any ST elevators, nothing facing that. So, uh, but the reciprocals are V1, V2, V3, V4, uh, actually, uh, and usually, in my experience, you don't see a posterior one without some some uh, problems also, in, I mean, a ST uh, elevation in 2, 3, or AVF. So uh, usually inferior and posterior go together because of the, of the blood supply. Okay, so here's an inferior MI, and it says evolving ST changes, but here are your changes in 2, 3, and AVF. Now, this we can say has been not in the last, not, not in the immediate one or two hours because it has a Q wave developing, but you can see the marked ST segment elevation in 2, 3, and AVF, and um, you see depressions in uh, V2, V3, etc. cetera. Uh, it's also significant depression in uh, AVL, which is the exact opposite um, uh, facing. Next. Another right ventricular MI, um, and this time, you know, the, the trick with right ventricular MIs is you, uh, is the right ventricle is, uh, or the uh, inferior uh, leads are off are are supplied uh, often by the right coronary artery. So when you say a right ventricular M MI, you're talking about a right coronary artery. So the uh, RCA is occluded, um, and the problem with that is the a right ventricular M right ventricle is is as you recall the the weak. The weak ventricle and it's a low pressure because it's feeding the lungs. The lungs are uh, the lungs are a low pressure system. The right ventricle normally doesn't generate that much pressure. Um, uh, 30, 40 pounds of push or or millimeters of push. Uh, but. And it depends entirely uh, because it's a low pressure system, it depends entirely upon venous return to the to the right heart in order to pump it forward. So it's very, very volume dependent and flow dependent on uh, on, on preload. And if you uh, if you do anything which decreases the preload, it's going to uh, markedly affect the output of the right ventricle, which is feeding your lung, which you kind of need to be able to oxygenate normally. Uh, also, it helps to maintain, if, if nothing is, if you're not pumping enough fluid through the right ventricle, you're obviously not ultimately getting enough fluid through the left ventricle. Uh, and so it's very dependent upon um, flow through the inferior vena cava and the venous system to preload the heart, and if you give patients things like uh, nitroglycerins, which drop their uh, peripheral vascular resistance and as well as expand their venous capacitance, then you decrease the venous return to the heart, which causes you, causes the person to go into fairly profound uh, hypotension. So, if you have a an inferior MI, uh, you want to determine whether this is just the run of the mill inferior MI involving the left coronary distribution, or if it's a true right coronary distribution and right ventricular MI, which which you have to be more cautious with. So we w w want you to do both a V3R and a V4R on that patient. 
A lot of times you just you, people just do one, but if you do a V3R and a V4R, you catch about 95% of the cases of uh, right ventricular MI. And in this case, take a look at V3. This was a V3R, and what you're looking for is ST segment elevation in those leads. The V3R, and you look at V4R, yes, there is ST segment elevation. I can, we didn't put in the, we didn't put in the previous inferior MI uh, tracing, which was just the regular V3 and V4, but it was, it was normal. You can see the pattern all of a sudden changed from when you went from V2 to V3R and V4R, the QRS pattern has changed, which means you switch, they switched the leads over to the other side. But this would have been the same progression with ST segment depression in V2 and V3 uh, if they hadn't done that. So this is proof of a right ventricular uh, MI, a right coronary involved MI, and you have to you have to treat that one with much more caution, which basically avoid avoid um, uh, nitros unless they're uh, uh, unless they're ex extremely hypertensive, which is probably not true. Next. Now, an anteroseptal MI. So uh, you have your uh, SD segment elevations and ultimately Q complexes uh, if they occur in leads V1, V3, and V4. Now, this is um, this is th this what probably would have been caused by the uh, or this probably would have been noted by your 12 lead machine saying poor r wave progression which means that uh, v v3 is basically a q or v2 is basically a q but uh, that's not really the point here the the trick is that you've got st segment elevation in anterior leads so in uh, v1 2 3 or it's actually, you could also call it anteroseptal because of V1. Next. Here's, an, here's a plain anterior, but this one is also uh, um, this has marked ST segment elevations in <clears throat> two, three, four. Uh, and you notice that, interesting enough, it's got ST segment depression in V6. But then when you get over to leads 1 and AVL, which are high lateral, you've got, you've got uh, uh, ST segment elevation there. So this probably involves, uh, if, if, if this patient goes to the, um, goes to the cath lab, Prob this will involve, involve the left coronary artery, probably will involve the left anterior descending uh, and a portion of the uh, circumflex artery, which is providing that, which is going to that left, to that anterolateral spot. Uh, but it's sparing some of the artery uh, in between because because you don't have a pure lateral. Uh, here's another anterolateral. You can see the uh, uh, ST segment elevations in one, in uh, AVL, and in basically two, three, V two, three, four, five, six. So this is a, this 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 is a, this entire this entire left corner artery <laughs> is at risk here. It needs to be opened up. Here is a pure high lateral. So one and AVL. And you can see the reciprocal leads in two or in three AVF. Now I want to talk I want to talk about let's let's go to the next one. I'm going to come back to this one, Mark. Okay. We have talked recently, and there's been quite a bit of interest in uh, ST segment elevation in AVR. Um, 
No, ST segment elevation AVR may accompany an anterior inferior stemma. Uh, STEMI. Uh, 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 the, the research I've done, which is not in great depth, but suggests that if you have ST segment elevation, elevation AVR and also an anterior inferior STEMI, so either one, that may in that may be uh, an indicator of increased mortality for the patient. Now, what about isolated ST segment elevation in AVR? Well, it occurs generally. It, 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 it's probably better to think of an isolated ST. You know, remember to call a STEMI, we really want to have two contiguous leads. And so a stem, an ST segment elevation AVR doesn't doesn't meet that. So it's almost always associated with reciprocal changes in other leads. And so it's probably best thought that these are that the ST segment elevation is a reciprocal change to diffuse ST depression. And here's where these things usually come from: repolarization abnormalities such as left ventricular hypertrophy or left bundle branch loss account for 30% of these cases. Now, metabolic and toxic things such as hypokalemia, digitalic toxicity also accounts for about 30% of the isolated ST segment elevation. It's also associated with reciprocal ST depression in the other leads. Then there's non ACS shock, such as sepsis, hemorrhage, which is misspelled, uh, dissection, and uh, pulmonary embolus. That's about 30% of the, of the cases. Acute coronary occlusion accounts for less than 10% of the ST segment elevation in AVR, and usually. It's um, due to diffuse multi-vessel coronary artery disease. Now let's go back to the to the next one or the, the one before. Okay. Here you have a patient. Look at AVR. You have nice ST segment elevation in AVR, and you have ST segment depression and inversions in one, two, three, AVL, AVL, sort of sort of generalized all over the place. This this one case it was indeed due to basically a left main occlusion. And this patient was stabilized in the emergency department and ultimately went to the cath lab. I mean, quickly, but not as a STEMI, and had multivessel disease and could not be stented and went and ended up getting a, um, a, a coronary artery bypass, uh, multi grafts, about five of them, as I recall. So, move ahead. Okay, now this, what is our rhythm here? Well, our rhythm appears to be regular. There's a nice rhythm strip at the bottom. It is rapid. It's a narrow complex. And we have ST segment elevation in AVR. And we have inversions and some depression in 2, 3, AVF, uh, V2, V3, uh, V4, 5, 6. So, um, what would you think uh, if I would tell you that this is a 90 year old person? Uh, who's got a blood pressure of about 70, 
has a respiratory rate of 35 and a temperature of 97. This was not a STEMI. This fits the characteristic of a person in shock who's in septic shock. And indeed, this was what this was. Um, and with appropriate fluids and some uh, non coronary intervention, uh, this person did well, but this would not be called in as a STEMI. So now let's go to the next one. So how do we deal with this isolated ST segment elevation in AVR? Treat per patient symptoms. So if they look like they're in sepsis or if they look like they're fluid short, uh, if they look like they're having a PE, you treat them in that, that way. Do make a code three return to the hospital because these are sick. Don't call the STEMI activation. I won't get really mad at you and I'll tell you why, but don't call a STEMI activation if you're thinking about this, but in your Pulsera report, tell them you're coming in code three, include in your narrative that you have ST elevation in AVR. You can also include whatever else you have about the patient that they're shocky, that you suspect sepsis. I don't, you know, and then, but send a 12 lead via the Pulsera. The ED physician will review that Pulsera and they will notify the interventional cardiologist that this person is coming in and that they have ST segment elevation in AVR but they will not trigger the STEMI pages. Most of these people will get stabilized in the ED and then if indicated an early trip to the cath lab. I mean, it, it within, generally speaking, within a, a few hours, depending on what their, what their ultimate problem turned out to be. Now, if they turned out to be a sepsis patient and they didn't uh, and they don't need to go to you know and 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 they're and they're cleared and their and their st segment elevation improves that they're you know if they're 90 years old they probably won't go to the cath lab unless there's another indication <clears throat> now when i say i won't beat you or i won't get too mad uh the way that our STEMI system if you call this a STEMI by error and you send a pulsera report and the and the 12 lead to the to the ed the ed physician will first look at the 12 lead and make his or her determination whether they will trigger the full cath lab sequence or not so he will in this case he or she will probably talk to the cardio the interventionalist on call anyway uh even if you call it a STEMI, but it's it's really it's really nice if um you know it's really good and it, it would make me feel really good if you would not call it a STEMI. this is the I, i've talked with uh, uh dr hanley who directs the ed and this is how they would they would prefer this to go they're very aware of this as an issue they've had there's been quite a bit of discussion within the group about this already so th these people are not going to this not going to fall off the radar they will be they will be appropriately dealt with. But remember, less than 10% of these people are actually having um, are actually having an MI. And if they don't have symptoms of an MI, it probably is not an MI. If they have symptoms of something else, that's probably what it's due to. So looking at STEMIs, what do you, what do we do with you know how how do we how do we determine if this is a STEMI or not? Look for ST segment elevation greater than one millimeter in two contiguous leads that automatically put, says no i shouldn't call a STEMI for uh, a for sd segment elevation in avr only know where you're looking use the pocket card as a reference if you don't remember these things so 
next month. So, your inferior MIs are, are 2, 3, and AVF. Um, we see a lot of inferior MIs. Don't forget, when you have an inferior MI, do V4, V3, and V4R as well to find those, to find those nasty left or right uh, coronary artery ones. Septal is V1 and V2. <coughs> now, you don't see pure septal very often. Anterior is V3, V4. Lateral is V5, V6, and 1 and AVL. Now, what about the STEMI mimickers, the things that throw us off that we shouldn't call as a STEMI? Uh, acute pericarditis. Acute pericarditis uh, as ST elevation in most leads, once again, except for AVR. No reciprocal ST segment depression, except possibly in AVR, because you know, it just like if you have ST segment elevation in AVR, you have reciprocals in other leads. It's sort of it's sort of reverse link. Go back, go back, Mark. Don't go that fast. Okay, so in this case, V one has elevation, two has elevation, three has has a little elevation. AVL, AVF has a little elevation, V1 has a little elevation, V2 is a lot, V3, V4, V5, V6. So uh, how do you have, so you look at this and you look at the patient, uh, the patient is alive and complaining usually of some unusual, some chest pain that's different than what you might think of uh, it's and it may be you may get a history that there's been an associated uh, a recent uh, flu. Uh, uh, it, it, the pain is often worse if the patient leans forward so that it pulls a little traction on the mediastinum, uh, which uh, means it gets kind of a plural plural catch to it. It's also worse often if they swallow because it irritates the. Uh, um, uh, the, the back of the mediastinum when they swallow, <clears throat> and they may have a little fever, uh, et cetera. They may have some flu-like symptoms. Uh, generally, younger people, and you really can't have uh, an inferior septal, anterior, lateral MI and have all coronary arteries involved. It just doesn't work. So. This is a pattern that you know you have to look at the patient, look at the presentation, and they say, mm, you know, I think this is likely pericarditis. I don't think I'll call a STEMI on this one. Next one. Left ventricular hypertrophy. Well, we see that a lot because uh, of people who have hypertension and they also then have left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and the way you so a narrow or wide complex uh, with a, um, and you look at your largest negative deflection in V1 or V2 and add it to the largest positive deflection in lead V5 or V6. So you put V1 and V5 together or V2 and V6 together. And if the total is 35 or greater, that's left ventricular hypertrophy. And with left ventricular hypertrophy, because you've got a you've you've got enlarged muscle, uh, your your repolarization, which is your um, ST segment, your T wave, uh, your uh, your repolarization starts out a little later and so you end up with elevation of st segment so you can't call it as as a STEMI. 
Now, if so, if you have somebody who's complaining of chest pain and they have ST segment elevation, and you say, oh, this is hypertrophy, send it in, send it in, go in, take, go in code three as a, as an ACS and, and treat them exactly like you would if you're thinking that they're having an MI, but uh, you'd be better off saying this is, put in your pulsera, patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, ST segment elevation, you're not calling it as a STEMI. Now, we talked about rec bundle brains blocks and the fact you can read an MI, yeah. Because you can read an MI through it because the Q waves and the STT changes are not altered by that right bundle branch block. Remember, you got your terminal terminal R wave uh, in V1, and so so if you look across there, you've got ST segment elevation starting about in V3, V4, V5. Uh, you've got a little bit in one. maybe a little bit in ABF, but you've got more than enough to say, hey, this is ST segment elevation and I believe it. So this is a right, uh, a, a right bundle branch block with a STEMI. Next. Same thing. Uh, ST segment, you know, right bundle branch block by definition, look at V1, and then you've got ST segment elevations particularly in V4, V5, uh, well, probably V3 as well. So uh, I would go ahead and call that uh, uh, a right, uh, a STEMI with a right bundle branch block. Next, left bundle branch block. Now you've got a widened QRS, downward deflection in V1, a uh, little fat, it's not not truly an R uh, an R RSR prime, but it's a kind of a fat uh, slurring. So in V6, but this is just a a nice right bundle branch block. Doesn't meet left ventricular hypertrophy, but with the ST segment elevation in V1, V2. This is this is what you get with a left bundle branch block. You can't read that ST segment elevation. Next. So here is another example, left bundle branch block. You've got ST segment elevation in V1, V2, V3. Depression in V4, V5, V6. Um, and now, so go back to, to that, Mark. We'll talk a little bit about discordance. Mark, go back one. Okay, discordance is normal in a left bundle. Brain. What discordance means is that the ST abnormalities are in the opposite direction of the primary wave. So it's in, in this case, look at V1 and V2. You've got ST elevation, but you've got a big S wave or a big QS wave. So deep deflection opposite the way the, of the ST segment elevation. And if you look throughout all of these things, you you have the ST the ST segment, either elevation or depression, is going the opposite way of the primary QRS complex. That is discordance, and that is normal in left bundle branch block. What is not normal is what's called concordance. And if you were to find any, any lead in which you had an upright QRS and ST segment elevation, that would be called concordance. Now, this, and this indicates that yes, this is a probable acute infarct in that lead. You don't need three, you don't need two, it's really nice if you have two, but 
you don't need to, you can have just one. But concordance is probably the only, the, the, there's a, a, a whole series, there's about four different things that you can calculate to see that, well, yeah, if this is a, th this, this could be a, a real um, a STEMI on top of a left bundle branch block, but concordance will catch about 90, 91% of all the, the possible cases. And the rest are so complicated that you don't have time to mess around with them in the field. Or, or you're, and they're, they're happen so, un, so rarely that you don't, you know, you, you don't think about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, in our, con I don't think I've seen a single example of concordance in the last year that came in on any of the STEMIs or any of the um, um, any of the um, ACS cases. So concordance is not normal. If you find it, note it. You can call that as a STEMI, but please let down, let the let the ED doc know that you, you know, put in your pulse era concordance in um, AVF or whatever. Okay, next. Benign early repolarization. It's an EKG pattern that's really common in young, healthy people, and they say young, less than 50 years of age. Generally speaking, widespread ST elevation, most prominent usually in the left uh, mid to left precordial leads v2 through 5 but uh the case we're about to show you is is not in that it's in other leads but you look for uh the the confirmatory thing you can always suspect it uh uh but confirmatory is notching or slurring at the j point you can see this you know so the j point is where you measure the uh where where, where the ST segment begins basically, and you get a little notch there. Next. So look in uh, lead two, lead three, lead four, and actually that's where your ST segment elevation is noted too, but uh, there's ST segment elevation all over the place in this particular one, but the notching is much more evident in two, three, and a bit in AVF. This would be, and they put that together with the patient presentation, um, and you call this benign early repolarization. Next, ventricular aneurysms. Well, that's and these are interesting. Uh, we had a run of these uh, uh, several years ago, but uh, I haven't seen much recently, and I suspect because. Uh, I suspect because we're getting much better that we, we've really moved people into the cath lab quickly and we're avoiding the uh, effects of uh, early STEMIs, uh, the long-term effects. Uh, what happens in a ventricular aneurysm, you get a bleb, uh, a little ballooning in the ventricle, uh, basically because uh, a piece of uh, an area, uh, enough of the ventricle got killed with the previous uh, Am I that it now becomes uh, uh, weakened? It's 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 healed. It's fibrose, but it's uh, has a tendency to balloon out because it's dyskinetic. It doesn't have any any functional muscle anymore. So when the ventricle con contracts, it's like squeezing one end of a balloon. It, you know, when you make your little balloon animal, you squeeze one end, and the other the other end sort of uh, sort of expands, so it pops out when the ventricle contracts, and that changes the um, that changes the vector forces uh, that are recognized by your 12 lead. So what happens with the with ventricular aneurysm is you get persistent ST elevation after the MI is over and heal, and it should have been healed. So your MI should your your the effects the the EKG effects on your, um, uh, the EKG effects from an MI should be essentially gone, except for the Q wave, uh, after eh, certainly two to three weeks. Um, 
these often occur in V1 and V4 because they're they're left ventricular in origin, uh, but they can occur in any lead. Uh, and the patient has to have a histor history of a full full thickness transmural infarct, or in other words, to have a STEMI. If you don't have a transmural infarct, you have you don't have STEMIs. You have what we'll call N STEMIs. So and and they're not going to give you ventricular aneurysms. Next. So here is a patient, uh, and I can tell you, you know, you, you get the history that he had his MI two months ago. So the choice is, does, <laughs> does he have, you know, if he comes in with chest pain, is he is he having uh, an acute STEMI, or is he, uh, or is this evidence that well, if he's not having any chest pain, he's not having any symptoms that suggestive of coronary of, of a STEMI at that point, then he should not have ST segment elevation at this time. So this is what you see with a with a ventricular aneurysm: this persistent ST elevation in the leads where he had his previous MI. He's got big Q waves. Um, throughout, that's a, that'll be your machine will say this is poor R wave progression. I'm sure it is. It's all Q waves all the way across until you get to B five. But this is uh, this, you know, patient did was not having symptoms of pain. He was having other symptoms, um, and so this is not a STEMI. Next, so quickly into Clark County protocols. Now, when people have present with chest pain, and chest pain is, uh, remember, it's different in older people, it's different in um, uh, women, uh, chest pain and chest pressure uh, are the equivalent. Um, treat as per our universal patient care protocol, start oxygen if needed only, to, to achieve an SpO2 between 94 and 98. So if they're already sitting there at 97, you don't need to give them any supplemental oxygen. Obtain a 12 lead and the goal, there is a goal of that. Our goal uh, for our um, uh, patient care is in less than 10 minutes from, on, from arrival of a unit capable of doing a 12 lead. So if fire arrives first and they are capable of doing a 12 lead, you would start doing the 12. The, my goal is to have that 12 lead done within 10 minutes or less of arrival. This is done concurrently with other treatment. You, that's why we that's why we try to get your uh, EMTs be able to assist you. Everyone should be able to know how to put on the the 12 lead patches and get the patient going. So as you're interviewing, as someone is interviewing, someone can be doing this thing. Someone can be putting the oxygen on if they need oxygen, etc. OK, aspirin. If they're having chest pain, chest heaviness. If you think this is ACS, coronary syndrome, <clears throat> aspirin, 324 milligram PO, contraindicated in known allergy, active bleeding, severe liver failure, severe systemic disease. Usually if you ask them, uh, are you, um, you have sinusitis, uh, 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 history of sinusitis, bronchitis, uh, other allergies, they may be allergic to, uh, also asking if they're allergic to, um, uh, if they're allergic to non-sterile and inflammatories like ibuprofen, then they're allergic to aspirin too. If their systolic blood pressure is greater than 110, nitroglycerin or nitro spray. May repeat every, times two, so they can have three doses altogether every three to five minutes. Why do you repeat it? If they're still having chest pain and if they don't have, and if they don't have, uh, um, uh, if their blood pressure is stable. 
Now, remember we talked about right-sided myocardial infarction, so positive, you know, an inferior MI with positive changes in V3R, V4R. So caution, what do I mean by caution? What I mean by caution is don't give it unless they're hypertensive. So if they, if if you take their pressure and they're 180 over 100, you're not going to hurt them. You know, if you drop them, if you drop them by 30 points, it's not going to. It, it's gonna, it's going to make them better. If they have a pressure of 100 and you drop them by 30 points, then they have a pressure of 30, and that might not uh, of 70, and that may not be very good. It's also contraindicated in pa patients taking phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So any of the um, um, uh, ED drugs such as uh, Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, Sil Sildenafil, etc. Ask them if they've taken it within the past 48 hours. If, it, if it's been longer, if, if it's been before 48 hours, uh, it's okay. But patients drop their blood pressure just tremendously on this because of the uh, of the nitric acid. Now, or oxide rather. Uh, vascular access should be done prior to giving nitro. Um, just as a safety factor. If they're still in pain or if they were allergic or could could not receive nitroglycerin, you can give them fentanyl in small aliquots, start out the lower dose if they're in a, in a low blood pressure, but fentanyl won't significantly drop their blood pressure. It's not like uh, morphine, which was uh, very, very vasodilating, fentanyl does not do that. So uh, fentanyl, 25 to 50 mics per uh, I, per IV, and it should be it can be titrated to affect. Your max dose is three mics per kilo. If they're hypotensive, follow shock protocol. This is the simple thing to do. Now, if you suspect an acute MI. Let's go to the next protocol. OK. In your COPS, uh, acute MI suspected STEMI early response protocol. Patients saw active chest pain in less than 12 hours. Uh, it's just a matter of taking the cath lab as much as anything. 12 lead EKG with ST segment elevation, one millimeter greater, and at least two contiguous leads. That's an ST segment elevation MI. No left bundle branch block. Remember, paste rhythm gives you a left bundle branch pattern because you put the you put the pacer um, uh, probe in the right ventricle. So the right ventricle depolarizes first, followed by the left ventricle. So it's a left bundle branch pattern. So paste rhythms cannot also, you cannot read an ST segment elevation MI, a STEMI on those. Now, the only exception is left bundle branch block with concordance in one or more leaf, which, which we talked about at some length. And it's very unusual. Treatment, notify ED of acute MI on the Pulsera report, provide all the, tell them all the care you gave, including aspirin, nitroglycerin, and analgesia per chest pain protocol. By the way, one thing I need to mention is that one of the, one of our, one of our failings in our documentation of this, and also possibly in, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing that it's possibly in the treatment as well, is you give the patient nitro, and then nothing happens beyond that point. I don't, you know, there may not, there, you, need, you need to do vitals, including the vital sign of pain. You need to see how their pain is doing. How do you, you know, we need to know that in your chart, if you gave another dose of nitro, why did it, if you didn't give another dose of nitro, why? Did the patient's pain go away? If they started out, if they had a pain of, nine and they still have pain of nine um why 
uh, they need they need either some more nitro or they need some or they need a reason that they that you couldn't give it. If the initial 12 lead is negative, now they're going to go. These are going to come emergently code three to Peace Health Southwest for emergent cath lab. If the initial 12 lead is negative or inconclusive, repeat it every three to five minutes if symptoms persist. If your 12 lead indicates an inferior MI, do V3R and V4R, both. The simple thing to switch both those over and do it. Next. Patient care goals, identify that STEMI quickly. So I'd like to, I'd like to get it down to less than 10 minutes of arrival of the first capable crew. Determine the time of symptom onset, activate the hospital-based STEMI system of care, monitor vital signs, cardiac rhythm, be prepared to provide CPR and defibrillation if needed. A lot of, a lot of people, I mean, it's, pr it's probably a good idea if someone is having a really, you know, if you know they're having a STEMI to put, to come in with your patches on, saves you having to put patches on, you know, uh, in a crash in the back of a rig. You've got patches on and you can and you can spark the patient as needed. Administer appropriate medications, document response to that, and then transport to the appropriate facility, which is all STEMIs go to Peace Health Southwest because it's the 24-7 cath lab. Next. The end. Now we should look at the chat and see what was in the chat. There isn't anything in the chat. Okay. Does anybody have questions, comments, thoughts? Crickets? <laughs> 